I guess uh, I'll, I'll start off by uh, introducing uh, the team. So uh, I'm Billy Felton. I'm a director of technology at Verizon Wireless, uh, part of an organization called uh, National Network Operations, uh, which basically is the heart and soul of Verizon. So that's all where all of our call processing, uh, a lot of the application services that we provide uh, our customers uh, is managed. Um, my, my specific role is a, a role pretty much dealing with disruptive technology. So uh, I'm you know, deploying a lot of the cloud technologies, uh, a few other things that we're, we're working on, right? Um, you know, the challenges that we faced, um, I think building the team has been building a really flat organization uh, that's cross-functional and then applying that into this national network operations team that takes a great deal of pride in, in the quality that we provide. Uh, our customers. I mean, we have the best network in the country. We're proud of that, and we want to continue to have that. So uh, instituting change in an environment like that's a pretty challenging feat uh, to accomplish, especially while you're trying to deploy this cloud technology as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Andy and Sanjay, who are going to uh, co-present. Uh, I think uh, I'll turn it over to you, Andy, if you okay. want to. Okay. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, thanks, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> no problem, Andy. Um, so some of the topics we'll cover today, um, the central theme here clearly is we're talking about um, managing a deployment um, using OpenStack at hyperscale, right? So um, we're going to sort of define what we mean by hyperscale. We're going to talk about why we're doing this, um, sort of talk about how we've achieved some focus to actually do what we're doing. We're going to talk about orchestration for a little bit, and some of the challenges we've hit how we manage this, and ultimately um, sort of land on this concept of self-service. So one of the guiding principles that we've used um, as we've built the team and built the practice is that we want to create a product, you know, a self-service cloud environment that's actually easy to use. Okay? So a guiding principle is people should want to use the platform, right? So it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't go against the green for which how their line of business actually works, right? So as we embark upon this journey for change within the company, we needed to make sure folks actually wanted to do it. Okay. We'll define what we call VCP quickly, right? So VCP, or the Verizon Cloud Platform, is a multi-tenant environment, right? It's an environment, uh, an, environment, an environment intended for all of our lines of business. So across our wireless organization, our enterprise services, our wireline business, okay? Um, and ultimately, there will be capacity available for folks that maybe even are outside of our organization. So there's a lot of folks that are going to be in there using it. So we like to think of this you know, as a large-scale environment with OpenStack at its core. Okay? Now, OpenStack is clearly our engine or our Vim that we're using. There are some other technologies that we're using around that as well, and we'll talk a bit about that. And some, also some custom applications that we've built as well. So the, the, the platform itself, this is kind of interesting, we define it by a group of products or services, right, that we're offering back out to the business. We don't let the applications necessarily define the platform itself, right? So this is kind of an important guiding principle as well, because we need to actually be able to support multiple types of applications, okay? So as we think about how we build and how we need to repeatedly build our different locations, we need to keep the semblance of a uniform environment across, right? So our, basically our SLAs are at the service level, right? So services like compute, network, storage, right? Metering, benchmarks, things like this. So some of those are core OpenStack services, some of them are not. For example, we've invented a service status API, which is a product that we have, which actually gives out an enumerated value about the health of our services. Right, so this is something that we've built on our own and added to the OpenStack deployment. Okay. We need to give users the ability to quickly deploy and support their applications. Right? So yes, um, we want to leverage the tenants for what you know, uh, OpenStack bring us, but there's other things involved in well, as well. Right? So the ability to quickly ask for new resources. Right? The ability to quickly ask for increases in resources that, you, that you've already got. Right? So as we move folks towards the ability to do things on their own without necessarily having to ask for permission, it should be easy to do. Right? So we wanted a common interface for everybody to come to right? for provisioning their infrastructure. Okay? And we're achieving that through some, some custom UIs that we're building. Right? And this should be on demand and it should be self-service to the best of the capability of the platform that we can. 
So that's how we define it from a high level. How do we think of hyperscale? Well, it's large, <laughs> relatively speaking, right? So I guess large, you know, it, it, it's sort of a, it depends upon the size of the organization how you define large, okay? So for some of you, large might, might actually be small for other companies, and some small deployments might be large for other companies. But for us, it's fairly large. I'll get into some of those details. There's a lot of instances that are running, okay? And there's gonna be more and more instances that are coming with a lot of users. It's distributed, right? It's distributed across, domestically across the United States now, and we'll, we'll, we'll be growing us across um, internationally as well, okay? It's gotta be elastic, right? So as we need more, we need to be able to scale out quickly, okay? And again, this repeated thread that I keep bringing up, right? It has to be easy to use. Not that I don't love Horizon, right? We all love Horizon, right? Um, so why are we doing this? Well, our network is our most valuable asset, right? If we can actually create products and things that overlay on top of the network, right, and actually, you know, actually create a repeatable SLA for folks, well, we get to actually leverage what we've invested so much money in. We want to be able to get new features to customers faster, so ultimately, Right? We want to be able to leverage the tenants for what DevOps or CICD brings to the table for our whole ecosystem of developers. Right? And by doing this with VCP, we can allow folks to deploy things very quickly, which leads us into the ability to improve this notion of an agile environment for our developers, but also for our suppliers, right? for folks that are actually building applications and delivering them to us. Right? Ultimately, we know that this will reduce costs both, both up and downstream. But we also realize that there's an initial investment that's important, okay? So initially you have to invest to save, you know, in the future. So again, it should be distributed, it has to be disposable, and then dependable, okay? So some more guiding principles for us, the three Ds. All right, so in order to build the platform, which we've been doing over the past uh, year or so, um, we had to find some focus, right? We had some brilliant planning that was done for this, right? We had a business that clearly was seeing the value for doing cloud computing, okay? So finding focus and figuring out, well, how do we actually begin to productize this thing internally so that it's repeatable, defendable, and something that folks can rely on? Orchestration for us is a big deal, okay? Orchestration actually drives a lot of the business cases for why folks want to build or leverage VCP. There was a lot of noise around the business, and there still is. You hear a lot about, well, how are we going to onboard things, right? The Etsy Mano overlay for NFV, right, and VNFs, right? So, you know, what are we going to use for orchestration? Okay, but different people define orchestration differently, right? So I would actually argue, you know, first there's this concept of tertiary orchestration, which is sort of, you know, above the stack, so to say, right? Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, movement in this area in Etsy Mano world, right? And then there's this concept of secondary orchestration, which is basically at the stack level, okay? So you don't really do tertiary very well unless you have the secondary orchestration available. But more important to us initially was to figure out the first level of orchestration, okay? So if I had to flip these around, you know, and think about it from the bottom up, the, the ability to quickly orchestrate your infrastructure provides a very solid platform for doing your stack level orchestration, okay? Which then gives you a dependable environment to do tertiary orchestration on top of, okay? So that focus for us was very important, okay? So not to, to actually plan backwards, okay? So we embarked on a journey to figure this out. And um, here's some interesting facts for you. So to figure out how to get that underlying environment set straight, right, so that it's repeatable, so it's idempotent, right? We had a lot of different pieces of hardware to deal with, right? 16,000, you know, pieces of fiber and copper cables, right, around a little over 270 leaf switches, 80 spines, right, 300 patch panels, over 1,700 servers, right, 445 terabytes of memory in those servers, and some folks on our staff with very sore fingers, <laughs> you know, when we had to actually put some of that memory in there. Right, 38,000 cores, okay, of which we can oversubscribe. Right, 90 racks, 76 different storage arrays, right, over 4,500 hard drives, in seven locations, right, with 21 regions. 
and availability zones. Well, we're gonna adjust the availability zones as we see fit, okay? A lot of provider networks that we had to plumb up, okay? And then, of course, there's the tenant side, thousands of networks and thousands of instances going on top of those, right? So, and this is the first wave, right, of capacity we're building in the core. So some challenges. Well, the hyperscale in and of itself is a challenge, you know, creating an environment that can, you know, scale, right, and is easy to use. Just the, 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 the tenants or traits of what hyperscale means, the distribution across the country. We needed to do things in a repeatable manner, right? Unfortunately, every single one of the locations that we're working in is not exactly the same, okay? So we had to account for that, okay? Repeatability in the way we actually do the build itself, okay? The community with which we're working in is, let's face it, they're sort of used to doing things in a, a bit more of a stovepipe manner in terms of operations, right? So OpenStack is kind of a horizontal technology, not a vertical technology, right? So the community with which we work in needed to actually affect, we needed to affect change upon it to get this done. Resilience in the environment itself, so the maturity of the API is the maturity of the Vim, right? We have to account for, you know, the ability to keep this thing running, because we need to bring the value back to the users, and that user experience to us is extremely valuable, right? If you go to use something and it's not a pleasant experience, you're not going to really want to come back and do it again. Okay, and that goes for onboarding right down to folks that are actually provisioning their VMs and building their networks, okay? Ultimately, we know that this is gonna affect massive change on the organization, massive, right? So from an environment where it once took months to get a server, you know, purchased, you know, space on the floor, transport done, powered up and available, two minutes, okay? So uh, from an organizational perspective, this has had a tremendous impact on us already. So some guiding principles that we've used to do this, okay? Version control everything, okay? We version control everything that's, that has a config in it. We look at Git as a core component for how we build our own applications when possible, right? So we're wrapping around it when we need to. So anything that basically has a configuration is stored, right, and version controlled. Another guiding principle is make things machine readable, right? not necessarily human readable. So a design document or, or some documentation that we have, we like to provide REST APIs as documentation, right? We like to provide uh, things that are reusable, right? So you force yourself to actually keep these things up to date if they're things that other systems are relying on. No physical configuration, right? Talk about muscle memory in an organization. We are used to, our engineers are very used to kind of knowing the machines, right, and knowing where they are, right, where they sit in the data centers, you know, which part of the data centers are, you know, hot or cold. Yeah. They get um, attached to them. They get attached. Well, it's the whole <laughs> cattle versus pets thing, right? <laughs> this is the reality of it. So, again, another guiding principle. No physical configuration. Serialization and delivery. Well, yeah, we want to be able to go at things, um, you know, in, in a repeatable manner and serialized in the sense that we know exactly what's being done in terms of order of operations, right? Not to be confused with being able to do things in parallel, because actually by doing everything I'm describing to you, it's allowed us to actually, you know, not do things in serial per se from a process perspective, right? But that order of operations, very, very important to us. This concept of declaring everything in advance, you know, actually building out our environment as, an ad, as built, right, from a CMDB, Right, and then having our installs actually go to that environment and ask about the servers or the nodes that it's configuring. Right, we've achieved this. Some new territory for us um, is leveraging bots, <laughs> you know, to do things as well. Right, so we've embarked upon a bit of this chat ops journey as well. Right, we're using it where it makes sense. Okay, our bots can respond to things in our uh, basically in our loops um, from our monitoring platforms. Okay. So when we pick up, pick up events, right, on the platform, whether it be a hardware event or, you know, something with an OpenStack service, we all love uh, Rabbit a lot and, you know, some of the other services that are there, right? So when we're looking at that and we're saying, okay, we're seeing this behavior, is this behavior real, right? If we can decide and figure out, yes, there's some weird behavior here and it is real, we don't drop it on the floor, we actually instruct a bot to go off and do something or to remediate. Right. So we've got some loops uh, that we've built for actually looking and, and maintaining the stack itself, but also the underlying servers. So this has been interesting for us. 
Um, it's been quite a journey, and actually we're achieving some success with the bots. Mm -hmm. People are starting to become friendly with the bots. It's a little weird. Um, anyway. So managing this, I mean, this, this conversation is about how, you know, sort of managing a hyperscale, right? So in addition to sorting out, you know, how do we attack the build, right? And how do we make this thing um, uh, predictable, right, for applications to run on top of, we actually have to figure out how to manage and plan as well, okay? And from an operational perspective, we start to mince a little bit into the product side of this thing as well because we needed to federate this thing, right? We needed to actually make sure that I, you know, in one of my regions, am the same person in another region, right? And, you know, that person's the same person in another region, okay? So we've created a solution around our IDMS, or the identity management itself. Particularly storage is an issue as well, right? Specific plans around how are we gonna provide storage, you know, in terms of performance and the breadth of the types of storage, okay? Security for us is a big deal. We've actually uh, had some interesting work over the past few months, you know, sort of the collision of, you know, the folks that are systems administrators or SAs versus the stack folks, right? There are two different viewpoints on the same infrastructure, right? So when we think about hardening an OS, it's a little different than hardening the stack itself, right? And then the, uh, you know, rate with which change occurs um, for those two are different as well. So metering for us has been an interesting um, 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 journey as well. So the metering platform that we've built, and Sanjay will talk more about as well, um, has actually created an organizational overlay for VCP, or AKA OpenStack, right? So through our metering platform, we've actually implemented the ability to model an organization, right? Above and beyond what a domain can provide or a project, right? So we can create an organization, and that organization can have a many-to-one relationship, right, to um, people or tenancies, right, or projects. But then it also implements the ability to build a service product, right, or a collection of services that are rolled into a product that somebody can select and use. And then, lastly, uh, it gives us the ability to, to, to implement a rate plan on top of that, right? So now I can start to look at the overall value of the consumed service coming off of my infrastructure, right? So we can, you know, in a year or two, actually look at the numbers with which we spent versus what folks are consuming. Right? So what is the intrinsic value of that hardware that we're now abstracting right, through our platform? Okay? So the organizational overlay you know, forced the product planning on us. Okay? Monitoring is a big deal as well. Right? You need to have complete visibility in what's going on. We've had to build a plan for doing monitoring. The build itself, I've spoken about at length, right? but actually you know, planning for how we're going to do the build was important. Okay? Uh, originally, and this has been a long journey for the organization, right? Uh, a lot of folks in our company have been working with OpenStack for quite some time, okay? And we love every new version that comes out. Things get a little better each time. Um, but I think having a forward-looking view into what's changing from a de deployment perspective and an operational perspective has been very important for us as well, right? The prereqs, right? Any of you in the room who have been uh, building a platform on top of OpenStack understand that there's a pile of prerequisites that need to be in existence before your stack build's gonna work, okay? They need to be predictive, okay? So we've actually got a specific plan around that. Data retention for us is a big deal. Once things are out there and, you know, and being leveraged, we need to allow folks to be able to actually retain information about their build, but also the data that's flowing through their applications that are on top of the platform. Work with our uh, partners Trilio there, okay? Upgrade and patching, okay? One of the reasons why we're leveraging, you know, uh, diversity in our sites, right, across the country, but also within the sites themselves, is to give us the ability to have an independent stack or region with which we can constantly upgrade and bleed traffic off of uh, production stacks and move people onto the stack that's not necessarily in production but has been upgraded, okay? Um, our self-service experience, okay. Well, this is, uh, this is all the work we're doing on terms of building and, and, and planning and making this thing uh, reliable What's the one place where our customers are going to come in and actually do it, right? It's the self-service experience itself, right? Um, I think the dashboard that ships with OpenStack, the one that shall uh, be called Horizon, right, is okay for some people, right? It's not okay for the entire customer base, right? So we have built some technology to help us there as well. 
So let's talk a little bit about self-service experience, you know, metering a bit. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Sure. Let me scoot over. Yeah, I'll sit over there. So I think uh, Andy's, uh, Andy's points covered what I like to think of as all the key issues around day one. Like, what does it take to stand up my OpenStack cloud? Once I've stood it up, what does it take to manage it at a systems management level? But OpenStack doesn't deploy in a vacuum. OpenStack deploys within an organization, as Andy repeatedly said. And organizations consist of people. People have needs. There are different types of people with different needs. And so that's the piece that we've been working with uh, Andy's team on. And I'll just take a couple of slides to talk to you about, uh, about those items. <clears throat> so who are the stakeholders? I mean, obviously, they're the, they're the operators, they're the consumers. But then, organizationally, at a management level, there are folks who want to know what the health of their applications is. Uh, there are people who want to know whether the money, that's being, the money and effort that's being spent on OpenStack, what's my return on it, what's my, uh, what's my cost, how does it compare to what I might be spending in public cloud or in some other environment. And so having that kind of visibility uh, and being able to provide it across the board at multiple levels of granularity, being able to roll it up into an organizational view as it makes sense to the specific use case for Verizon or, or anybody else, uh, those, are, those are key considerations. I mean, those are the day two considerations that if you don't account for those, uh, you may have built the most stable, most scalable, most repeatable environment, uh, but if you don't address those other needs, you haven't fully planned for success. And so, uh, KPIs, I mean, having a set of KPIs around what your OpenStack cloud looks like, being able to define those, being able to collect data about those, and being able to share that data as appropriate is critical. I mean, you, you have to think, for, think about and address the day two requirements. Um, and so uh, what, what are some of those guiding principles from a day two perspective, right? Uh, cloud, is, is from the consumer's perspective, should look like an environment that has infinite capacity. Reality is it doesn't, and so how do you, how do you maintain that balance? Um, the, the key first step in doing that is to capture the right metrics and, and to watch them closely. So uh, looking at, at usage and trends and, and who are my top consumers and so on, uh, critical requirements. And then once you have that data, uh, additionally having mechanisms to encourage good behavior. I mean, to, to encourage stewardship of, of ultimately scarce resources. I mean, when you're talking about the scale that, that Verizon has deployed or uh, some of the other folks in the room might, might have, uh, there is a lot of juice behind this, but ultimately it's, it's limited and you want to make sure that things are being utilized the right way. So when I say provide the right data to the right people, what do I mean? Uh, here are some key uh, or some common things that, uh, that come up and, and people want to know the answers to. So customers want to know, and, and by customers we think, you know, who's the, the ultimate end user. Typically, from our perspective, a customer consists of multiple projects or a, it's a line of business or something. So they want to know what their usage is and what the cost is, obviously. Cost is a good... Uh, a good, good lever for, for good behavior, right? If, I, if, if unlimited resources are available to me just at the turn of a faucet, but it don't cost me anything, I'm less likely to, to be thoughtful and, and, and a good steward. Uh, operators need to know what the capacity usage is and what the forecasted usage is, so then they can plan ahead. Do I have 30 days of capacity? Do I have 60 days of capacity? Do I have more than 60 days? I'm good. Um, customers and operators both need to know what's overutilized, what's underutilized, where can I reclaim resources, where can I improve performance. Um, the business unit owners need to know their current and projected spend, and then ultimately, uh, at, a, at a senior management level, you need to be able to measure that TCO and ROI. And then finally, um, there are varieties of cloud experience, right? Like the book I read in college, Varieties of Religious Experience, and the same way there's varieties of cloud experience. Uh, you know, you may have a Cloud Foundry use case where OpenStack is just the layer and, and what you're interacting with is the past. You may have an API uh, end user experience. You may have a scenario where Horizon is sufficient for what you need. And then you may have a scenario where it's not, where there's a different uh, uh, use case that you want to support from, from a self-service and front-end perspective. So being able to acknowledge all those different scenarios and being able to say, maybe there isn't a one-size-fits-all and, and I, I need to have the ability to support multiple uh, interactions uh, optimizing for that, that end user experience and that self-service in the way that makes most sense for those particular environments, that is also critical. I mean, ultimately the success is gonna depend on how your end users uh, interact with it, how, uh, you know, how pleasant the experience is ultimately, uh, and, and being able to, to support that, give, give some real thought and, and effort into that, from my perspective, is critical. 
So, I guess so, you just turn over the keys too, right? That'd be the yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> lessons learned are more Andy's lessons than mine, so I'm going to hand this back to him and uh, put him back on the spot here. Okay. If I yeah. may. Sure. Uh, I guess I'll remain sitting for this yeah. part since we're wrapping it up. But um, yeah, I mean, are you, you know, lessons learned uh, create a beautiful user experience, right? Create an environment that folks want to use. Um, a lot of times when I've worked with other, other teams, when I first begin with them, I always say, well, why do people buy things, right? And I get all kinds of answers. Oh, it brings value, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it helps the business, but ultimately people buy things because they want them, right? Um, at the end of the day, they'll figure out how to pay for them in a certain way, but simply it's because they want them. And we want people to want to use this platform to make their business or their line of business function easier, okay? Taking a real good look at the, the core um, you know, projects within OpenStack and figuring out where the holes are, um, or at least where the evolution or the maturity isn't quite there yet, looking for the gaps to figure out where to focus internal development efforts on is important. It was very important for us in, in our, first, our first part of this journey. Um, tracking DBAS you know, and, and the overall uh, you know, community behind NFV was also very important for us. We noticed that um, sort of the inability to leverage, um, you know, uh, traditional uh, database, you know, in the cloud environment was a, becoming a gating issue. So we embarked on a journey for looking at, well, how do we provide, you know, database as a service, you know, via our APIs or our Trove API. Um, and we found some folks with Tesora that have some great ideas there, okay. Um, so uh, service level agreements, I, this, is still, <laughs> this, this is something we're still sorting out. I'm looking at some of my colleagues in the room, right? So it's like, it's very different to put an SLA on a service than it is on a server, right? So the servers are based on the services that are being provided. So this is a bit of muscle memory and evolution for us as an organization, is what does that service level agreement need to look like? Um, and you know, actually, what does it need to read like? Um, there's uh, implications for how applications are gonna actually plan uh, for the use of, of your platform. And uh, we always have this sort of you know, notion, well, how do we get 5.9 sitting on top of a 3.9 infrastructure or a 2.9 infrastructure, right, initially? Um, so that's an important part. I mean, you need to provide the diversity for your, for your, for your uh, applications. Organizational buy-in, uh, wow. Um, this is, is definitely a challenge for us. Um, but this is something that, you know, I, I can't stress enough to, to some folks in the audience that are embarking upon this. Some of you I've spoken with already, it's, it's kind of like you need to take folks along for the journey. I think when, when folks actually leverage and utilize a platform such as VCP, uh, light bulbs kind of go off more so than, than necessarily uh, conversations or lots of meetings. It's actually getting in there and leveraging and using it and seeing how it brings value uh, to your, your project. Um, you know, actually starts this sort of you know, uh, horizontal or grassroots Ruchish kind of behavior where you know, people become even you know evangelical within their own organization, right? So that's been really interesting. I know. Yeah, I mean that's that's been the one of the biggest challenges is, is uh, you know deploying a technology that that basically enables you to to utilize all these new practices, right? Which are strange for us in the telco space, right? You know, agile and this DevOps thing everyone hears about, right? Um, the, the big challenge is we as a company have a tendency to want to wrap a technology around our organization, right? And so once you do that, right, you've basically broken all the principles of cloud computing, right? And you've turned it basically into a bunch of bare metal servers. Um, or a bunch of clouds. Or a bunch of clouds. A whole bunch of clouds operating independent. But, um, yeah, well, you're paying a hypervisor tax just for the fun of it. But, um, you know, so the, the challenge is, is that balance, right? Because you can't take a large company and change them overnight. So, um, especially a, a successful company, right? Um, so it, it's, a, it's, as Andy pointed out, you know, you, we build the technology, people will come use the technology and they'll start to learn. They'll start figuring out better ways to manage their own projects, to manage their own products, um, and they'll change and they'll evolve with the platform. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's been our, our biggest challenge, I would have to say, yeah. is the organizational ones. So, I mean, this is a really quick talk, right? So, I mean, we talked briefly, we defined uh, VCP, Verizon Cloud Platform, um, as an environment that is defined by its services, right? Not necessarily defined by the applications running on top of it. Um, we defined hyperscale, distributed, right? Lots of stuff going on, lots of moving parts. Um, why we're doing this, there's business value for us. Ultimately, we need to get uh, products to our customers faster, mm -hmm. right? Um, our focus, you know, began by having to slow down and kind of, you know, look at the project 
and get that, get that base first level of orchestration nailed so that the secondary orchestration or heat, right, the stack level orchestration is dependable and then we can have our NFB style tertiary orchestrators working in an environment that they can rely on. Um, some challenges that we had, we went through those. The management of the environment, bots are important to us. The monitoring, right, the benchmarking of the platform. Another tenant that we have, or I should say guiding principle for us as we manage this is complete and total transparency, right? So putting our benchmarks out via our internal web presence so that our customers can actually see what our storage, our block storage performance is. What is our virtual CPU performance speed, et cetera, things like that, allowing them to make decisions on their own moves us towards this concept of self-service, right? So, I mean, we have like three minutes left and, um, you know, we're, we're here, we, we'd like to take some questions if you have questions um, or we'll, we'll be here afterwards as well, so, yeah. We've got one here. You gotta drop it. Yeah, you gotta. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> Can we get this external, this, this mic turned on? Yeah, he's got you. Hello? Okay. All right. Thank you. So, you, um, obviously, uh, OpenStack is very technology focused, mm -hmm. but from your discussion, um, it sounds like you can manage the technology by applying engineering. The bigger challenge is the process side. So what resources exist in the community to help organizations tackle the process piece versus the, the hyper-focus we tend to have here on technology? Sure. You want me to go or you go? Uh, you, can, you can start. So, so for us, that's a really great question. I mean, we're, right. we have a lot of process, and we have a lot of process for good reason. Um, very solid base company, solid customer base. Um, so what we're doing is not to disrupt existing business per se, but to introduce things in a new manner, right? So. The old stuff can't just die, right, in one day. Basically, we introduce a new way of doing something, right? We evolve toward it. So it's sort of a die on the vine strategy, right? So process should be built into the interface with which people are using this, right? From a customer perspective. Now, from an operational perspective, process is built into our declarations, right? Actually into the underlying infrastructure as code, um, you know, uh, that we've got running. So anyway, when we bring up a new way for doing something, the old way eventually goes away. And folks will move over to doing it in a new manner in a way that doesn't create friction within their organization. Sorry, so resources in the community, right? Um, from you know, my viewpoint, I think the more we talk about this and the more that we get public information out there, um, I think the community is just slowly growing. Our space is very enterprise focused, right? So we've got that overlay. Right, so the more that we're able to provide information back out to the community about what we're doing in Verizon, I think is going to be a big, you know, factor in this for other folks as well. So in, in short, you have to create those resources yourself, right? So there's, there's books that uh, if you want to spread buzzwords throughout your company, it's a great way to get started. But uh, if you want to actually take it a step further, it's a lot of meetings with your human resources department, your security groups. Uh, seriously challenging all of the process and procedure that you have in your, your, your company and, and, and really being an instrument of change. Um, that along with the technology, people will tend to follow. So, okay. We've got a question up here too. Thank you, Lisa, for doing this. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, your talk was nice, but somehow generic, I would say. <laughs> Sorry to say. What do you plan to do organizationally? Where do you think that the first impacts will be on your um, manpower? And, and how do you do reskilling? What do you, how do you prepare for, for the transition? It's a very process? generic question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll give you a generic Try answer. Try to nail it down. Uh, I'll give you a generic <laughs> answer. So, so there's really not going to be any immediate changes to our organization. So I, I built a, an organization that's uh, already built around the principles of DevOps, right? So it's cross-functional team. It's scaled to the size that it needs to scale to. Uh, all of our legacy technology is not going to go away anytime soon, right? So there's no need for any type of immediate change at this time. Is that good? So this new thing, is this a matrix organization? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. It's a good question. Yeah, so not generic. I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, listen, we've got this horizontal team, right? OpenStack in and of itself is a horizontal technology, and our team is sort of built in that manner. 
but our organization is definitely, you know, vertical, right? So what we're doing is building, you know, sponsorship from other organizations, and we are sort of having folks come in and work with our team that aren't necessarily, necessarily members of the team, right. right? That's important. It's also important for us to provide the proper resources in terms of training and the ability for folks to take it upon themselves to embark upon a new journey, right? So we're seeing a lot of folks, um, you know, that have been part of the organization for a long time that see this as actually a breath of fresh air and an evolution for them, okay? So I think providing really good information about how we're doing this to them allows them to model external organizations like we are as well, right? So, you know, I've also seen enterprise, you know, transformation done in a much more, uh, how should I say, like an EA style approach, enterprise architectural approach. Um, that doesn't align very well necessarily with trying to do this at this level, right? Um, you have to have proof, right? So instead of building a lot of artifacts in advance, our art artifacts are actually the applications and the teams supporting them, okay? So again, it's manifesting itself in the platform itself, right? The platform trains you as you use it, right? As you go through it, sort of reducing that, you know, friction that, you know, folks entail. You know, hitting it. Back here. one all the way in the back, yeah. We actually pre-planned this, Lisa, to, you. You know, so that you could get the most amount of exercise possible. So you're up next, right? You know that, right? <laughs> so at 1,700 compute nodes, what's the, at hyperscale, the total number of current customer workloads you guys can support, or are supporting actively? Um, I don't have that number prepared, right? So the total number, um, it, that's a difficult question for me to answer, to be honest. But um, so in an individual site right now, um, we've, let me answer it a different way. Um, we've figured out that in one location, right, which is basically, you know, one-seventh of that number, right, um, the oversubscription ratio that we're comfortable with right now is three to one, right, that's going on there. We haven't maxed out an ind individual site yet from a testing perspective, right? We'll be embarking upon that, you know, over the next month. So the next time we get up and have this conversation, we'll be able to provide numbers like that. Cur current customer workloads? Yeah. So just specific to what we have currently running, um, we, we have probably, what, about 30-something projects uh, that, that, that are in uh, varying de uh, degrees of performance requirements on, on each. Yeah. Uh, we've, we, you know, we've got probably another 100 or so projects that are all based around, you know, uh, I don't want to say lab work, but that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. A lot of the software providers are learning how to do that uh, secondary uh, orchestration that we spoke of earlier, right? Yeah. Applications that are running, you know, that they're, they're calling themselves in production today are fairly, you know, um, simple applications, web-style applications that are running. Uh, Nginx stuff, some Apache stuff, some database stuff like MySQL kind of stuff, and then a lot of proof of concept work around core um, applications that participate in call flows, right? So lots of testing going on there as well. And I think that, you know, as we move forward over the next few months, we'll get some, you know, pretty good idea of how far we can stretch each of these environments. I think he's a current consumption. Yeah, yeah how are we expecting a, it to evolve? It's a, oh, yeah. We know it's going to evolve. So our current consumption, very high, 80% you know, consumption of our physical memory in the boxes. Uh, our storage <laughs> is at like 2%, right? You know, we've got you know, some adjusting to do there. Uh, CPU in one location, 60%. Uh, but that floats up and down depending upon, you know, what testing is occurring. Um, you know, and this, it's a really good question. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we've built a metering platform as well. So we can actually go in and look at that in a dashboard and tune, right? So clearly I've got stranded CPU. Right. Okay, that's okay. it. Thanks guys. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.